Hello, and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Newsbaum. We have a very special friend of the family on today, but before I bring her on, let me remind all of you in ATP land to do us a favor. Take out your cell phone and text the word TRUTH, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to the number 88202 when you push send. You'll be signed up in four or five seconds to receive all of ATP's work product, the videos, the writings, the uh, links to all the important things that we do absolutely for free right in the palm of your hand. Okay, then let's bring on Claire Lopez, long time in service to the United States government, the State Department, the CIA. She is our resident expert on American foreign and domestic policy, and she runs Lopez Liberty. Welcome back, Claire. Thank you, Barry. Always glad to be back with you. Oh, always a pleasure. I learned so much when we chat and it's always appreciated. So let's just jump right into lots of big news this week to ask for your opinions. Russia has just demonstrated an anti-satellite missile strike capability. They blew up one of their own satellites with one of these missiles, and now they have joined or are rivaling China in capacity and capability for, well, I guess you'd call it space warfare. So Russia and China have now added a warfare component to their military in outer space. Is this their answer to the United States Space Force? Will there be a Cold War in space? Well, you, you know, Barry, the militarization of space has been going on really for quite a long time. Uh, we've noticed it, of course, with China, uh, which is probably the leader in anti-satellite uh, capability. Russia now maybe trying to catch up with China. Um, the thing about the, uh, the Russian test, uh, they blew up an old defunct, not, not functioning uh, satellite of their own, but the debris that's scattered from the, 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 uh, the explosion, the breaking up of that satellite uh, actually threatened uh, to damage their own space station up there. So they weren't terribly careful about what they were doing. But the point of it is that they've demonstrated a capability uh, like China's now, uh, that I don't know that the United States has a defense against. Lovely. It just gets worse, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Coming back to Earth, the long-stalled Iran nuclear talks are back on starting in a week, and supposedly they're having the pre-talks now in Vienna. Uh, Iran is demanding an end to all sanctions, and the Biden administration, like everybody seems to say, and I think rightly so, is demonstrating that they are indeed the third term of Barack Obama, because Biden will enter this deal again, remember Trump pulled us out of it a few years ago, with any possibility of success being quite minimal, in my opinion. The inspectors for the IAEA, the UN Inspection Group, the International Atomic Energy agency is saying that they've been locked out of many sites, they have not been doing inspections, and Iran is bragging about massive enrichment progress. What the heck is Biden thinking to dive back into a deal that has already failed? Well, your misperception, I, I'm sorry, your misgivings uh, 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 about uh, these talks are very well placed, Barry. Um, and what I would say is that within the Biden administration, there are many appointees and, and others who uh, previously served in the Obama administrations from 2008 until 2016. And so you've got some of the very same people driving the very same impulse, I guess, to uh, cozy up with, with, uh, with the Iranian regime. Uh, the thing about the, the talks, the thing about the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or Nuclear Deal, first agreed to in 2015, and then, of course, then President Trump withdrew the United States in 2018 because the Iranians were so far out of compliance. And now, three years later, three and more years later, uh, the Iranians are even more out of compliance. And so for that reason, I don't see exactly how they'll get back into it badly as uh, the Biden administration and, and, and leadership seems to want to. In terms of amount of uranium 
enriched in terms of the levels to which it's being enriched. 60% is what they're admitting, which probably means they've gone way beyond that, that they're not admitting. Uh, there is no civilian use for that. Um, the fashioning, the, the, the milling, the molding of uranium metal, again, absolutely no civilian purpose for that, except only um, to make a nuclear bomb. Um, uh, and of course, the, uh, the installation of many thousands of advanced centrifuges. These are the uh, tubes, the, uh, the equipment that spin up the hexafluoride gas and, and enrich it. Um, and they've got newer, faster, better models in there now. Uh, that means they can get to a bigger stockpile of enriched uranium all the faster. All these things in violation of the original nuclear deal, JCPOA of 2015, never mind in violation of the original NPT, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that Iran remains a signatory to as of back in the 1970s. So I don't see how they can get back to it. It seems like as I listen to you, and everything you say is true, this regime is so rogue. I wonder, is there anything they could do short of, I guess, shooting missiles at a carrier uh, from the United States that would empower Biden to have the chutzpah to say, okay, enough's enough. We're done with you. Is there anything they could do You know what worse I'm, than what they've I'm, already done? What I'm worried that they'll do, unless stopped by Israel or some other way, is that there will come a day when there will be a test fire. There'll be a test explosion of their nuclear capability. Now, it is in Israel's existential interest that that not be allowed to happen. And there have been more and more signals coming out of the top leadership of Israel uh, that they are for example, practicing how to uh, counter the, uh, the Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, they're, they're becoming more and more direct, the Israelis are, in, in, in talking about a military um, solution. But United States, the Biden administration, no, it, it, it doesn't seem that anything would dissuade them from uh, trying to talk some more uh, for all the good that's done. And of course, they never ever address the clandestine nuclear weapons program in Iran, which is where the development is taking place, as you said, Barry, places where the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors, are not permitted to go, even though they've made requests to go see these sites. Yeah, I think the news is bad and the stuff we don't know is probably worse. In the same neighborhood, as you know, and we've talked about a number of times, the Afghanistan pullout was maybe the worst disaster in modern United States foreign policy history. I mean, it was that badly handled. And in spite of the fact that the terrorists we fought for years and years and years are now the government, the Biden administration is sending them humanitarian aid. Now, this is the same place where the Taliban fighters are blowing up ISIS fighters. ISIS flight fighters are attacking Taliban. Both sides are brutalizing women and men who don't toe the line. By the way, they're all Muslims. So it's Muslim fighting Muslim and Muslim killing and torturing other Muslim uh, if they don't agree with Sharia policies of the government. So at this point, after the disastrous decisions the Biden administration has just made on Afghanistan, what are they thinking by giving more money to a leading terror organization that's now a government where probably the money we send them, Claire, is just going to buy more weapons to fund more terror? Well, I mean, of course, you know, money, cash is fungible. Um, and, and any aid that we send to the very much suffering Afghan people, the, not to take, you know, diminish that, that level of, of the horrific situation the Afghan people are in. But what I've uh, been seeing, and I think I've spoken about this on the program before, is a situation developing very much like that that existed in the 1990s prior to 9-11. And that means the various ethnic uh, and tribal groups, uh, the Pashtun, of course, the uh, largest of these, but also there are Tajiks, there are Uzbeks, there are Hazara, Hazara are Shiites. 
and now the new player on the block, the Islamic State. Um, and they're all descending uh, into internecine fighting. Um, not, not that we mind them fighting each other, but the victims are the Afghan people. That's, that's the, the part that, that, that has to bother all of us. And of course, the United States having left behind over, what, $85 billion worth of top, uh, top of the line equipment from helicopters to Humvees to small arms weapons of all kinds. Uh, they're very well equipped, um, even if they sell off some of that or, you know, barter it away. Um, the place is falling into utter chaos. And here's the thing. Um, it is also becoming a magnet, just as pre 9-11. Afghanistan is becoming a magnet for jihadis all over the world. Why? Because it is a functioning sort of uh, emirate. And uh, jihadis from all over the world, as before 9-11, once again are flocking to that banner, to that flag. So it's a very disturbing situation. It doesn't seem that the United States national security leadership is even remotely aware of what's going on or able to remember what happened in the 1990s leading up to 2001. Uh, it's, it's disturbing from a lot of angles and of course, including the thousands, and it is thousands of Americans and also uh, special visas, special visa holders, Afghan allies and, and partners left behind still to this day. You know, Claire, your, your understanding of the politics of this specific issue is so profound and so more advanced than the policy coming out of the Biden administration. If anyone asks, I'm recommending you for Secretary of State. Oh, dear. Uh, thank you, but uh, no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of foreign policy, um, there was just a virtual meeting uh, between Xi Jinping and Biden um, to work things out between China and the United States, you know, like climate change, even though China pollutes basically more than the whole rest of the world combined, while we're, you know, banning straws in California, they're burning coal like it was free and clean. Um, I'm very, very concerned if Biden has the backbone to stand up to China, especially uh, in regards to Taiwan. They're being very clear, they, the Chinese, that they're going to take back Taiwan. They consider it Chinese territory. They consider the Taiwanese government and the Taiwanese people to be renegades uh, and revolutionaries that need to be squashed. What do you think the United States is going to do when China finally does what they've been promising, which is the Cold War between the mainland and Taiwan becomes a hot war. What is Biden going to do? Well, intact vertebrae is not an especial feature of the current Biden administration. That said though, I'm not convinced that Beijing and the CCP uh, have the intent uh, to militarily invade Taiwan either just now or even after the Olympics that will take place in China in February of 2022, in a few months. Um, the status quo uh, may be the best solution in the eyes of the CCP, as well as the United States and other, other uh, allies, both Western and in the region, such as Japan. Um, and the status quo being a kind of a Cold War, a kind of a standoff. Um, I don't think, I've, I'm, I'm becoming convinced that uh, it, is, it is not in the interests of Beijing to actually invade with military force. Yes, uh, uh, warplane flyovers often, uh, but to actually invade and, and conquer Taiwan. For one thing, there are a lot of connections between Ty Taiwan and mainland China. A lot of business connections, political connections, intelligence connections that we don't necessarily see uh, on the surface. And, and so what I'm saying is that perhaps the status quo is the best that we can 
maintain at the moment uh, by a policy of, of combined deterrence um, and, uh, and simply the, the uh, reluctance, what I think is the reluctance of, of the CCP to actually physically invade Taiwan right now. Claire, tell people where they can find out about you and learn more about the work you do, please. Well, certainly right here at the American Truth Project at ATP. And as Barry was telling you, uh, on your cell phones, if you would like, you could also sign up for direct uh, cell phone text notification of videos like this one by texting my name, L-O-P-E-Z Lopez, to 88202. I also publish at the Citizens Commission on National Security at the United West. Uh, I have published at the David Horowitz Freedom Center's front page magazine online outlet and occasionally uh, do videos with Jamie Glassoff at the, at the Glassoff Gang on social media. You can find me at Claire M. Lopez on Twitter, uh, the same, my name, on Facebook, and at Lopez Liberty on Telegram. There it is. She's everywhere, the ubiquitous. Claire Lopez, thanks for coming on with us today. And thank all of you in ATP land for joining us today on a very insightful and informative program. We're very grateful for Claire coming on with us today and for you for joining us. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Nussbaum.